was good. Would you stand with me, please, as we read God's Word, reading from the 13th chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 18. Jesus said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Um, simple passage in some ways that, Lord, so instructive, so encouraging. How I pray that you will open it to us this morning in a special way. Thank you for the reminder today the church is a place for healing. Thank you for the uh, ministry that you've opened up to Leslie. I pray that you will prosper that, Father, and use it. I, th I look around, Lord, and I know there are needs in just about every life that's here for healing of one kind or another. Thank you that you are the God who meets every need. I pray that you will give us, Lord, empathy and sympathy, and that you will give us the ability to help exercise faith on the part of others who are struggling in some way. So we pray, Father, for your healing power. Lord, it all leads to this ultimate experience of the kingdom of God. I pray that we will sense it and that we will experience it in a very real way. There are so many people this morning who need it. Think of our missionary friends, the Losis, continuing to hold up Daniel, Father, hanging on really by the thread of your grace right at the moment to life, praying that a heart will be available, that you will sustain them until that time, that you will use their ministry, that you will use their trust in you as not only, Lord, good in the life of their child, but an inspiration to others who are around them. I thank you that every, every trial is an opportunity not an opportunity for us, not an opportunity to show our greatness, but an opportunity to show off your greatness. And so we pray that that will be true this morning. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This passage of uh, Scripture, I'm entitled already, not yet. I think you'll see why in a moment. The story is told of... Uh, military base where they had their annual softball game, you know, between the enlisted guys and the officers. And the enlisted guys won easily. But the account was written up by an officer. And so the way it came out was this. He said, the officers powered their way to a second place finish <laughs> while the non-coms came in next to last all showing that things are not always as they appear or as they are represented, right? Some of you may remember this limerick. God's plan made a hopeful beginning, but man spoiled his chances by sinning. We trust that the story will end in God's glory, but at present, the other side's winning. Sometimes it feels that way, doesn't it? More and more. That was looking to be the case in the disciples' world. Things were not happening as they thought and hoped that they would. And it certainly is very much the case in the world in which we live, is it not? That's why Jesus kind of all of a sudden in the midst of this passage inserts these two little parables. I love this passage of Scripture. The disciples have just watched a woman who has been bent and broken for 18 years be healed. And then they've seen the response of the society in which they lived. The religious leader is now the one who is bent out of shape because it all happened on the Sabbath in violation of his understanding of the Sabbath rules. He represents for us the growing opposition that's going to happen with Jesus from this point on that will eventually lead to his death. And of course, at that point in time, it will certainly appear that the other side is winning. 
but it will be an illusion, beloved. The disciples need to know that they are on the winning side. They need to know what we all need to know. We need the reminder. Faithfulness is driven by the recognition and the assurance that in the end, God wins. In the end, God wins. So Jesus teaches about the kingdom and he teaches about it from the standpoint of two realities that as we search out information about the kingdom in Scripture, because there is so much in the Scripture about the kingdom of God that it can sometimes be overwhelming and confusing. But what's clear as we compile the passages and really look at it is that there, is, there are two phases to the kingdom. There is an already phase to the kingdom and the time in which we live. And yet there is a not yet phase to the kingdom. In one sense, the kingdom is already here and operating ever since the king first appeared on the scene. And yet in another sense, there's so much more to come. It's not in full bloom yet, not by any means, but it will be. That's the message. It's coming. That's what Jesus wants us to understand. So he muses in verse 18 there. He said, what is the, what is the kingdom of God like and what shall I compare it? And he gives these two parables which emphasize both the already and the not yet nature of God's kingdom. So let's look first of all at the fact that the kingdom starts small. This is the already phase of the kingdom, if you will. The kingdom starts small. Jesus emphasizes here, it starts like the grain of a mustard seed, the smallest of the food seeds in Palestine at that point in time. Just a pinch of leaven represents how the kingdom starts. It shows, you know what it shows? It shows how God revels, perhaps you've noticed this in Scripture, but it shows how God revels in using the weak things of the world to confound the wise. He constantly does that. And when you recognize that, I suppose it's no surprise that King Jesus, when he shows up on the scene. The one who is the king of all kings, the one who will one day rule the whole universe. When he shows up, it is not with the crescendo of angelic trumpets or with neon signs lighting up the sky saying the king is here. In fact, it's quite the opposite, right? The already phase of the kingdom starts pretty unimpressively. The king is born in a manger of all places among the animals because there's no place for him in this world. It's a metaphor, of course. He's born in Palestine, which is the absolute backwoods of the Roman Empire, insignificant backwater place. He grows up in Nazareth, which is a small town unlooked up to in its time, in the time in which Jesus lived. 30 years, he worked as a carpenter in that region. When he finally began his ministry, there were huge crowds that came eventually, but we also know that eventually they turned on him and crucified him. The leaders that he left behind were not exactly the sharpest knives in the drawer, right? These men were men who were few, they were uneducated, they were slow to understand, they were hardly what we would look at and say, those are the ones I want for leadership. And yet, already had started, beloved, already had come. Because the already phase of the kingdom is God's rulership in heart. The kingdom of God in its ultimate sense is God's rulership wherever it is. And you see, in a special way, when the king came, the kingdom came with him and it began in the hearts of every believer. The kingdom was already starting. Now, within a few weeks of the time of Jesus' ascension, this little band of 120 followers had become literally thousands of followers in Jerusalem alone. By the end of the first generation of those followers of Christ, the gospel of what Jesus represented had spread all over the known civilized world at that time. 
Within 325 years, it had become the official religion of the Roman Empire against any and all odds. Today, 2,000 years later, there are, by most counts, something around 2.1 billion Christians in the world, almost one-third of the world's population. Christianity is the largest single block of any religious faith in the world in which we operate. Small beginnings can lead to great advances. Now listen carefully. I'm not suggesting that all of those 2.1 billion people are real Christians, I'm not. Many of them, probably most of them, are not true believers in Jesus Christ. They've taken that title without even having much knowledge of what it means, or at least without having any true commitment to him. So they are not necessarily true followers of Christ. Nor am I suggesting that this is the kingdom in any resemblance to the final state in which it's going to come, but I'm just suggesting that from something small, something great can come, and far more is yet to come. Even it's in, in the imperfect state in which things are, Paul can say this in 1 Corinthians 1. Just listen to this as I read it. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 27. Paul says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. We must never, beloved, be fooled by appearances. We must never be fooled by appearances into thinking that the kingdom of God has somehow become insignificant, passe, overlooked, outflanked, or in any way irrelevant. Never. The kingdom of God is not only operative in the hearts of those who are true believers, it will one day overcome the world. Appearances to the contrary, we are on the winning side. And the already phase of the kingdom is operating in repentant hearts today. It operates every time we let the Spirit of God be the leader in our life instead of us being the leader in our life. It operates every time that we choose to forgive rather than being vengeful. Let me give you an illustration. Turn with me to 2 Kings in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 5. <clears throat> You can get to uh, First and Second Samuel. Just keep going forward to First and Second Kings, and in chapter five, you'll come to this account that beginning that begins in verse one. This is history, which was taking place somewhere in the around 800 BC, about that time frame. And it says this: Chapter five, verse one of Second Kings, Naaman commander of the army of the king of Syria, which was one of Israel's great enemies, just to the north as it is to this day. Naaman was a great man with, a, master, with his, uh, a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory. Notice that, don't miss that. The Lord had given victory to Syria. Naaman was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the sermon, service of Naaman's wife. Okay, so those are, the, those are the bare facts. Here's what they mean. God had arranged for the Syrians, Israel's enemies, to come down on them in a raid because his people were deep into idolatry. And he was using Syria as an instrument of discipline in their life. In the process, this little innocent little girl was captured. Now, the fact that she was captured means that probably at best her family was also captured and sold into slavery somewhere along the line. At worst, that they had been killed, and if so, knowing the Syrians, probably before her very eyes. 
So here she is, carried away from home at a young age. She's at absolutely the low end of the spectrum where she lives now. She's a captive. She's a slave. She's a woman. She's young. Her life is utterly ruined. And Field Marshal Naaman is the reason. And she's in his house. Now, what would your natural reaction be? How would you do? I think we would all acknowledge our natural reaction would be what? To wallow in self-pity, right? Do the least you can do to get by in this situation. Rob them blind. You know, break the knickknacks when you're dusting accidentally, of course. Spit in the soup. I mean, you know, whatever you can think of to make life miserable for these people. And when you hear that he's got leprosy, what would you think? Ha, 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 leprosy. I can hardly wait till the next finger falls off. That's where we would go, isn't it? That's where we would be. I'll dance on his grave. Look at verse three. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Doesn't that make you wonder who is this girl <laughs> that she could do this? What kind of person is this? Beloved, let me tell you who she is. She's a, she's a girl, she's a little girl in whose heart God reigns. She's a little girl in whose heart God reigns. You know what she is? She's a kingdom person before the kingdom has even arrived. Because she's allowing God to drive her actions. What a, what a girl. Kingdom living before the king has even come. And you know, when you look at this, little action really, right? She just says to her mistress, oh, I wish he would go here. Of course, we know the rest of the story. He goes, eventually he's healed. I, I wish he would go here. A little action, but I'll tell you what, it's a big result, right? Not only is Naaman healed, she got herself in the Bible. What an honor. Because she's living by faith. Because she's a living representative of a living God. So I think we have to ask ourselves this morning, what, what little thing done in faith in our life would show the kingdom of God. What is it? What person are you hating that you need to give up the hate? Who is it that you'd like to take vengeance on that you need to give up the vengeance and forgive? Where is it that you need to be going and working because you know God wants you to do that? What is the covetousness that's in your life what, that, you're, that you're wanting that you need to let go of? What grudge do you have against God because he didn't do it your way? Where is it? that instead of living by faith, you're living by self. Because the already phase of the kingdom, beloved, starts in our hearts and works its way outward. We have the wonderful privilege of being part of the kingdom of God already. It starts small, but it starts in our hearts and lives. And so we need to do the little thing that will show the kingdom for what it is. Second kingdom truth from this passage, the kingdom grows from the inside. Kingdom grows from the inside out. What happens to the seed? The seed has to go into, into the ground, right? And as Jesus says in John 12, he reminds us, unless the seed dies, it can't live. And so there has to be this Death that occurs with the seed is it before it can become a tree. The seed is buried in the ground. The leaven is buried in the loaf of bread. They, are, they become invisible. They work from the inside out. They become invisible, but they persistently work to eventually produce amazing results. That's the already phase of the kingdom. It's already in operation. It's already producing amazing results in certain places where faith is being operative. But this kingdom is spiritually based. It has to start on the inside. This is where the followers of Jesus and the people of his time missed it completely. They expected the full blossoming of the kingdom, the full culmination of the kingdom. Immediately, they didn't understand this peace. 
because they didn't understand this peace and that most of them will never be part of the kingdom that they so desired and that they so wanted. That kingdom is coming, but it's only for those who have invited the king into their life. You see that? Jesus has to be your king inside, beloved, before he can be your king outside. Not my rules, his. It's what separates his kingdom from every other kingdom. But I'll tell you this, when that kingdom begins inside, it begins to work its way out, right? When, when the rulership of God grows inside the individual, things change. Inward regeneration turns into outward transformation. Listen, that's, what, that's the way the kingdom works. That's how you, how you know, are you part of the kingdom? Sobriety replaces drunkenness. Forgiveness replaces bitterness. Generosity replaces greed. Love replaces hatred, even for enemies. Selflessness replaces self-centeredness. That's the kingdom operating by faith. We don't do it because we think something great is going to happen. We don't do it because this was, was the way the world would tell us. We do it because we believe God. I like to think of the seed really as, as the word. Peter thinks of it the same way. Jesus, you may remember in the parable of the sower, said the seed is the word. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 3, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of the imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So as the word gets into us, it prompts the kingdom reaction that God is looking for, the leaven, I present the Holy Spirit here, I believe. The leaven could be likened to the Holy Spirit anyway, who indwells every single believer. The question isn't how much of the Holy Spirit do we have? The question is how much of us does the Holy Spirit have? The Bible says in Romans 8, 9, if you have not the Spirit of God, you are none of His. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer, if you are here today, you have the Holy Spirit. You can't get any more of the Holy Spirit, but I'll tell you what, He can get more of you. That's why Paul says, be constantly, continually filled with the Spirit. It's a command. What he's saying is, let the Holy Spirit who is inside you run you instead of you running you and confining him to some little, you know, Sunday portion of your existence. You put the Holy Spirit and the Word together inside of us, beloved, and, well, the kingdom will begin to operate Look at, uh, look at John 18, turn with me there. Jesus, when he's talking to Pilate before he's crucified, he has some things to say about all of this. John 18, beginning in verse 36. You know, they're having this conversation that kind of goes on and on, but eventually Jesus says this, John 18, 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. You know, Pilate's been asking him, are you really, are, are you a king? You don't look like a king. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Now, as you read that, you should be asking yourself, well, wait a minute. How can he say that? in light of all of those Old Testament passages that talk about the Son of Man, the Messiah, the King, coming in power and glory and dominion and taking over everything, someone who will sit on the throne of David forever, how can he say my kingdom is not of that world? How can he say that? And the answer, beloved, as you, as you begin to absorb Scripture, is obvious. The answer is that the kingdom has a spiritual basis. It is not of this world, but that doesn't mean it can't and won't operate in this world eventually, because it will. But it begins inside. It's not like earthly kingdoms. Earthly kingdoms are imposed from the top down. The kingdom of God is imposed from the inside out. And so when Christ comes, when the king comes, it'll be those who are 
already committed to him, that are believers in him, that have given their heart and life to him, that will be part of, and it, of his kingdom. And it, it's not gonna come with guns and tanks and swords and all that kind of stuff. It's created in the hearts of believers and then it has changed lives leading to a changed society. Christianity did not conquer Rome with bows and arrows and chariots, right? It won through the power of its message, through the faith of its believers, and through the blood of its martyrs. That's how it conquered Rome. What the Crusades failed to do by the sword to eliminate and throw the Islamic infidels out of the Holy Land, the early believers did at the cost of their blood. Tertullian said around 200 AD, he said the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. The seed starts small, grows big. Not, it's not the world's ways, it's God's way. It's how God establishes the kingdom. The cleansing effect of the Reformation took place as God's rule began in Martin Luther's heart. He'd been taught all these other things, but when he began to get into the word of God and God began to get into him, eventually he had the strength, one man, to stand against the papal envoy who had been sent to order him to recant of his teachings that justification is by faith alone on pain of death. You remember what Luther said. He stood up to him and he said, I do not trust either in the Pope or in the councils alone since it is well known that they have often erred and contra contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted. And my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. That's the kingdom. Operating by faith in the life of one Man, he fully expected to pay with his life for that statement like others before him, like Huss and Wycliffe had done. God providentially spared him to become along with Calvin and Zwingli and Melanchthon and others, the great men who brought the Reformation to bear. Today, Western culture, as you know, benefits greatly from the good of the kingdom influences that have come about because of these voices from the past. Our law is rooted in biblical principles. The Ten Commandments are still on the front of the Supreme Court. For how long, I don't know. But they're there at the moment. Our morality, our sense of morality is driven by biblical influences, even unbelievers. That's what... Jesus is talking about even, even unbelievers are like the birds who fly in and they get the benefit of the, of the limbs that are there in the tree that is the foundation of the kingdom of God. Now in our society, we know those benefits are rapidly diminishing. Does that mean the kingdom has failed? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. God's kingdom will prevail. Every new believer brings the ultimate manifestation of the kingdom, the consummation of the kingdom under the rulership of the king that much closer to fruition. The full extent of the kingdom has not yet been realized on earth. We know that, right? The king isn't here. Neither the Holy Roman Empire nor the kingdom of the Reformation, the Reformation kingdom of Luther and Calvin, nor the God-blessed kingdom of the USA, none of them have ever been the true kingdom of God. They've just benefited richly from kingdom members living kingdom lives and providing growth from the inside out that has spilled over into the political and the cultural influences, brief but imperfect previews of what will be when Jesus reigns completely. But the day is coming, beloved, when the final member of the kingdom comes to faith in Christ and the king returns to take his rightful throne. That day is coming. What a day that's gonna be, right? Every new convert brings us one more life closer to that event. Thirdly, 
the kingdom permeates everything. This is the not yet phase, not there yet. But the day is coming when what has already started in the hearts of true believers will blossom into a full and complete political and cultural rulership of God on earth in the person of Jesus Christ. The seed will become a full-blown tree. The little bit of leaven will infect the whole loaf. The kingdom of God starts small, it grows by fits and spurts, but in the end, it will conquer everything. It amazes me, you can go back in history and check this out, and we see it even in our day, but over and over, mankind is thought to put God out of his misery. Nietzsche, at the end of the 19th century, declared God dead because the enlightenment had come along, the age of reason, the age of human wisdom, and it was thought that, hey, science is gonna solve all of our problems. We no longer, no longer need God to explain anything. There is no God anyway. If, if there is, by some stretch of the imagination, a God who exists, he has no interest in this world. God is dead. That was Nietzsche's proclamation. Only Nietzsche was smart enough to understand if you take God away, you've just taken away the basis for morality. And he said, even though I believe it's true, I believe God is dead, I recognize that as people recognize that, evil will begin to predominate. And he said, the 20th century will be the bloodiest century in history. He was right, wasn't he? He was right about that. He was a little premature about God being dead. Time Magazine, April 8th, 1966. I can still see the headline in my mind. That's how old I am. God is dead. So they proclaimed. But as early as 1969, that was followed. There was a follow-on article, and I can see that one in my mind. Article on the Jesus people affirming, well, maybe they were just a little premature in declaring that God was dead. And by 1990, they were writing an article that declared, hey, God's making a comeback. Who would have guessed? And by 2009, Time Magazine was declaring that Calvinism, that old Reformed theology, is one of the 10 greatest ideas driving the world today. 2009. We didn't need Time Magazine to tell us that, right? The kingdom of God will never be overcome, beloved. The ravages of untamed naturalism in the, in the area of science, of atheism in the political systems of Nazism or communism or any other political system, all of them combined could not wipe out the kingdom of God contrary to predictions. Listen to this statement. Philosopher Paul Johnson said this. He said the most extraordinary thing about the 20th century was the failure of God to die. I love that statement. Paul Johnson is no believer. But he says, I recognize as I look back over it, Nietzsche said God was dead. Turns out he was wrong. The most extraordinary thing about the 20th century was the failure of God to die. Confidently predicted, widely expected by the educated elite, it did not happen and it will not happen. God not only survived, he flourished. The 1980 Time article conceded this. It said, God, wasn't he chased out of heaven by Marx? Banished to the unconscious by Freud, announced by Nietzsche to be deceased. Did not Darwin drive him out of the empirical world in a quiet revolution that hardly anyone could have foreseen? Only two decades ago, God is making a comeback. Not among theologians, but in the crisp intellectual circles of academic philosophers who have made tremendous progress in the last 50 years. Intellectual circles of academic philosophers where the consensus had long banished the Almighty from fruitful discourse. All of this, beloved, is just one step. It's just one more way that we see that God's kingdom, which starts small, will eventually take over the whole world. It exists already in an already state. It will exist one day in a not yet 
state already in the hearts of those who are true believers. One day the not yet element of the kingdom in the personal rulership of Jesus Christ over the whole world. It's coming. Just as sure as he came the first time, he's coming again. Descriptions of the ultimate expression of the kingdom of God are all the way through the word. I think the problem is we just, you know, we live these lives and we think life is gonna go on forever like this. It just doesn't seem possible that one day actually in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in some day when the sun is shining or it's raining or whatever else, Jesus is actually gonna step foot on earth again. He's gonna do that. The day is coming. Here's how Daniel saw it. Daniel 7, 13, he, saw, he said, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the son of man and he came to the ancient of days, which is God the father and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all the people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That's the kingdom. That's the not yet phase of the kingdom. God hasn't happened yet, but it's coming. Kingdom starts small in the hearts of believers. One day, beloved, the last person on earth will come to faith in Christ. The leaven will have infected the whole loaf and the kingdom of God will explode in the coming of Jesus Christ into an open expression of God's will on earth as it's done in heaven. I can't wait, can you? That's why God asks us to pray that way. Do you pray for the kingdom to come, for God's will to be done? It's part of the Lord's prayer. How can you not? The description of this, if you want to read all about it, is Revelation 19. Beginning, I don't know, I didn't look it up. What verse around 10, 11, 12, when suddenly Jesus is going to appear out of heaven after all this turmoil has been going on for 13 chapters in the book of Revelation 6 through 19 and suddenly here comes the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords riding on the white horse with the sword coming out of his mouth and he's gonna take over everything. The Lord is coming. He's coming again and the result is, is, is described for us in Revelation 5 when John says, and they, that is heaven's inhabitants, the kingdom's inhabitants, that's you if you're a believer. Hey, you'll be there. They sang a new song saying, worthy are you to Jesus. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. It's a culmination of history that's being talked about there. Worthy are you for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Here is the kingdom in full display. Aren't you glad you're gonna be there? You're going to be there? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you'll be there. This is what Jesus is describing to his disciples in this cryptic form in Luke 13. It's what he wants them to know. He wants to encourage them that however bad things look, however tough they seem to be, in the end, they are on the winning side. So he's saying, take heart. The kingdom is coming. It's not coming like you thought it was going to. It's not coming in the timing that you thought it was going to, but it's coming. So take heart. But you see what Jesus was, the reason he was so anxious to tell them this was because there was a piece of the kingdom that yet had to happen. The kingdom had to be paid for. He was on his way to Jerusalem even then to pay the price that would have to be paid so that all of this could happen. It didn't come for free. Forgiveness of sin is never for free. And so he's going to Jerusalem to die, to guarantee the outcome of this thing that he's talking about. And you talk about a small beginning. Imagine when you saw Jesus hanging on the cross, from a human perspective, that was sure defeat, right? Sure defeat. Here's how God looked at it. It's in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Listen to this. He said concerning the death of Christ that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Just when it appeared most that the other side was winning, looks were deceiving. It was an illusion. 
The impossible, instead, it happened. Crucifixion was followed by resurrection. Death was swallowed up in victory. The lamb had KO'd the dragon, beloved, on the cross. Twelve Galilean misfits turned the Roman world upside down. One monk and a sickly castaway named Calvin reformed the world and the kingdom of God is going to conquer all. Already is here. Not yet is coming soon. Let me tell you, in the end, God wins. Not New Age, not humanism, not Islam, not any other kind of ism, not secularism, not any other kind of religion. In the end, God wins. Don't you want to be on the winning side? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the assurance that though the kingdom starts small and unimpressively, it's going to end with a bang. be a bang of rejoicing for those who are believers. Bang of condemnation for those who have not entered the kingdom. Next few weeks, Father, we're going to see what the entry requirement is. Pray that you'll help us to bring our unbelieving friends and neighbors to see what this salvation is all about, to see what this kingdom of God is all about. Father, perhaps there's someone here this morning who's never come to faith in Christ. They've never seen the reality of all of this and suddenly it takes on a new meaning. We understand that life will not always go on like it is now. Things will not always continue as they are now. The only reason they do now is because God is patient, not willing that any should perish if they would just come to repentance. So bring us to repentance. Any heart here this morning, Father, has never reached out to you. I pray that right now, quietness of their heart, that they will reach out to you. They will confess themselves to be the sinner that we all are. That they will acknowledge their need of a Savior.